It's Conduit News Radio with Paul Harrell. Uh, welcome back to the program. We've got Congressman Rick Crawford on the line. Rick, it's always great to have you on, sir. Good morning. Hey, good morning. How are you doing? We're doing really good. Um, you know, on Wednesday, uh, we covered the State of the Union that the president gave Tuesday, and I have to tell you, uh-huh. I was just thoroughly uh, pleased with his speech. Yeah, I tell you, um, I think that he, this may be one of those sort of uh, uh, defining moments in this presidency. I thought he was, um, uh, what's what's not to like about that? I mean, you know, who, who else gets both sides of the aisle chanting USA? Mm-hmm. You know, um, he had some, some really good points there. What I like the most is his uh, reaffirmation of life, standing up for life unequivocally. Um, highlighting the cases where we're seeing around the country now, particularly New York, where they're basically advocating for and, and uh, codifying um, infanticide. Uh, so I'm, I'm really pleased that he stood up for life. And then the other thing, I think uh, it, people need to recognize that he sounded the alarm on um, socialism and where the Democrats want to go um, – their, their vision or lack of for our country. You know, I was challenged in the uh, in my reelection uh, campaign by a young socialist who said, you know, at least I have a vision. He, he he said, at least he has a vision. Well, the vision was of socialism. That's not a vision. That's a nightmare. Um, that's not well, that's not what this country is about. Uh, that's how many people have you ever seen around the world who have fled the United States? For socialism. Mm. Conversely, how many people have you seen around the world who have fled socialism to seek freedom? It just doesn't work. Even in Finland, uh, they're, they're figuring out that free money uh, doesn't work. Mm. And they're, they're turning the corner in places like Finland, which is, you know, it's a different kind of socialism. I guess you might call it soft socialism or something like that. Yeah. The big glaring example of it that we see is what's taking place in Venezuela right now. But even in Europe, they're figuring this out that, um, you know, years and years in, it, it, essentially at some point you run out of other people's money. Yep. And what, what we have here are Democrats who are unabashedly embracing socialism. And I'm 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 just not going to get on board with that. Yeah, <laughs> I think that I think that most Arkansans would agree with you, a vast majority. Um, you know, and I'll tell you this. You know, you mentioned the abortion comments, or you know, him bringing that up. I'm so glad that he did because it's a national outrage um, with what New York's doing. You know, what what Virginia is doing, and I thought his speech, the way it was written, there were several moments. Where, well, for example, let's take the abortion argument. Whether you agree with it or not, he mentioned the importance of parents bonding with their newborn kids and that in his budget he wants paid parental leave. Okay, whether you agree uh-huh. with that or not, that's in his budget. And he talks about the importance of families and everything else, and then he uses that. You know, so he gets the Democrats to applaud. Paid leave, paid leave. And then he says, oh, by the way, we care about our kids, right? And let me tell you how this New York situation and, you know, infanticide is a bad thing. I thought there were so many moments like that where he would couch, you know, another example would be on illegal immigration where he talked about uh, the, the criminal justice reform and how Congress did something that nobody thought could get done. They worked together on criminal justice reform. And we also need to do that to build the wall and secure the border. It was just really well written. The speech was very well written. No, I agree with that. I think that um, what he did was, you know, he, he sort of boxed them in in a way that, you know, it, you know, it, it made them look duplicitous. And, and the fact of the matter is what we're seeing from Washington Democrat leadership is, you know, on full display, their hatred for Donald Trump uh, outweighs their love of our country. And so they're not willing to even consider anything that might be perceived as a kept promise or a, a win for Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. They would rather endanger the country and, and, and win a political fight than they would to actually do what's best for the country. And then this, this, this business of New York's uh, abortion,
abortion laws and Virginia trying to descend into that chasm as well. And now there's other states. Massachusetts is going to follow suit. Uh, you know, even even pro-choice people think this is barbaric. You know, and and the other thing that that you know you mentioned the way that the speech was written in such a way that that he caught people up in agreeing with him, and then sort of now the question is why don't if you agree with this why don't you agree with that? So uh, another example of that is when he talked about. Um, uh, the number of women serving in Congress and how we've come so far. You know, the, there were all the women on the Democrat side were wearing white to to uh, commemorate uh, the hundred year anniversary of uh, suffrage, and and so they applauded that, stood up and and uh, and high fived each other. But when he talked about the progress in the workplace and uh, the uh, historic high numbers of women in the workplace cricket yeah now how's that work yeah i mean so you're applauding yourself for your accomplishment for being elected to congress but you're not applauding the huge increase in women in the workplace that's not noteworthy and that's because he has uh, advocated that and if they admit it and they acknowledge it that those numbers have improved under his administration then somehow they lose the narrative that he's a misogynist and hates women yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, that's exactly and right. So I, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not making a comment about his character or anything. I'm just, uh, this is a numbers issue. I mean, just look at the economic numbers. I don't care who's responsible for the economic numbers, but the numbers themselves are worth uh, concentrating on and saying, look, you got to acknowledge these are good numbers, all right? Mm-hmm. So if, if you don't like the fact that uh, you know, crediting Donald Trump with it, okay, that's fine. Um, don't then, but you could at least acknowledge the fact that the, the economy has improved in the last two years at significantly, and that um, unemployment is down to historic lows, and all of those things are worth acknowledging and and uh, applauding. Yeah, and it, it, they're so worried that they're going to be perceived as applauding for Donald Trump that somehow that's going to reflect poorly on their reelect when they go back to the Bronx and run for reelection. Yeah. You know, during the speech, I really, we're talking with Congressman Rick Crawford, I got the feeling more so than ever, he, you know, President Trump, he's a guy, I think, that genuinely loves uh, this country. And, ge- I mean, you know, this whole idea of America first, he really wants to think about every single citizen. What's the, what's the, what's the best outcome for every single one of us? you know, who, who live in this country. And, you know, that brings up the border. Are, is there an update? I mean, do you think that the Democrats are going to to compromise at all? Or are we going to have another government shutdown? Or is the president going to use the military to build the wall? What are your thoughts on that? What are you hearing? My sense is that they are, are going to kind of come to terms with this. And throughout the shutdown, you started to see Democrats waver on this notion that, first off, The wall was immoral, and under no circumstances would they support a wall. And then one by one, they started coming out and publicly saying, well, we're not saying the wall is immoral. Uh, We have a different perspective than the speaker. We do think that we should be able to secure the border where it's indicated and sort of kind of coming in line with what the president said, which was that, you know, the the experts on on the border, uh, Homeland Security officials who've been doing this for a long time, and, you know, CBP and things like this, this is what they're asking for. Let's give them what they're asking for. And uh, slowly you're starting to see a, a, a turn to a more pragmatic approach uh, that recognizing that, you know what, at some point in time, we're going to be held to account for this. And, if, and, and they're looking more and more like the intransigent ones here. Mm-hmm. And so I think that there's a realization that, you know what, maybe we don't need to go through this again. Maybe we should. Uh, I said this the other day at a, at a conference. You know, if, if, if I'm asking for five and you're asking for zero, how about we meet in the middle and agree on 2.5? Mm-hmm. You know, um, that's a good compromise, right? You uh, would not think. everybody gets it. That's, that's, that's the idea. And I said this before. I, I love my wife uh, more than anybody in the world, but I don't get everything I want in my own house. <laughs> Me <You> know? neither. <laughs> that's so, great. You know, how do these people function in life? I shudder to think what their interpersonal relationships are like if they're this demanding. And, and then the idea that somehow you can't compromise. I can compromise. There's, there's certain things that I won't compromise on. 
Um, but when we're talking about border funding, I think there's room there that we can grow into a consensus that says, here's what we need to do as a minimum. Are you willing to accept that? Yeah. And um, that that is something I think that we should be, be willing to say, look, these folks down there on the border that are securing our border, that are charged with that awesome responsibility of, of securing our nation and our border security, let's listen to what they have to say before you just dismiss this out of hand. Hear what they have to say and don't listen to it or, or view this through the lens of my I hate Trump glasses, mm -hmm. but, but, but view it through uh, the lens of I have a responsibility to the American people as an elected official to at least listen to what these people are saying and then form my opinion based on that. Right. And if they do that, I think they'll probably realize that, you know what, there's some merit in what they're saying. And, and, and I'll tell you another thing. Walls don't work. Fences don't work. Give me a break. They absolutely work. And, and, and they, will, they will channel into areas where we have a higher degree of presence and resources and the ability to interdict narcotics and, and human trafficking and things like this. But, but where we don't, that's what they exploit. So all this nonsense about, well, all the drugs are coming through the port of entry. You don't know that. We don't know what we don't know. That's a great point. What we know is we are we're able to interdict quite a bit at the ports of entry, but there but there are other narcotics and other assets, uh, or, or not assets, but individuals that are crossing in, that we don't know about. Mm -hmm. And the reason we don't know about it is because we don't have the resources, we don't have the barriers, whatever you want to call it, in place, and and, and the technology in place to give us a one hundred percent full picture of every movement of anything quant uh, commodity or or uh, or human being coming across the border we don't know what we don't know so to, to just to, to you know definitively say that all the drugs come across through the ports of entry that's a false statement and there's no way they can uh, quantify that so the president says that uh, I, I think one in three women uh, is, is sexually abused and of course there was a fact check on that. It, it, it was actually a uh, 31%, not 33%. So, you know, he, according to these, you know, uh, uh, the media gatekeepers, they got him, uh, I guess. Uh, that was something I yeah. thought part, that was one part of the speech, the, the sex trafficking that's going on, the amount of kids, the amount of women every year they're sold. But Donald Trump said modern day slavery. He said, we've got to secure the border to put these people out of business, coyotes, uh, the the gangs and everything else, and I noticed there was a lot of Democrats that were that that didn't stand up and clap for that, and I thought, right. really, that's that to me was right. just tone deaf. Well, absolutely, and you know the parsing of the facts there. You know, thirty three percent versus thirty one percent. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well, so you're, basically, what you're saying is we're willing to accept thirty one percent, thirty three percent. No, that that's the threshold at which we say no. But if it's below 33 percent, we're OK. And the reason we're OK is because he, he gave a false statement. He didn't give a false statement. I would think it's probably, again, we don't know what we don't know. So I, I would be willing to guess that uh, uh, that's probably closer to three out of five. I bet it's closer to that number mm -hmm. that are, that are uh, sexually assaulted as they're uh, you know, coming up in caravans, traversing Guatemala and Mexico. We don't know. But what we do know is that if their fact check is correct, it's at least 31 percent, and that's 31 percent too many. Mm, so why would why would you applaud yourself because you 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 know quote unquote caught the president in 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 a in a bad statistic? Give me a break, man. One is one too many. All right. And so the point he's trying to make is that this. There is an incentive for people to do this, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. And the incentive is that they can get across our border. And once they're here, then they can claim status, and then they can they can um, claim benefits and all these other things. But the problem that I have with this whole deal, as I've said before, is if you're if you want to come here to pursue the American dream, God bless you. So many people have, and we are so blessed in this country that we have something other countries don't have. It's unique. To our country, but don't come up in in, an, in this aggressive manner and be willing to start your American dream by breaking the law. How does that comport with the American dream? Mm -hmm. How 
does it comport with the American dream when you are aggressively approaching our border, waving your own flag, your national flag? That, to me, is an aggressive act. If I wanted to come to this country, and I was, I was a, a foreigner, and I wanted to come to this country, my first thought would be to assimilate. That's why you're here, right, is to come and avail yourself of the American dream. I wouldn't come waving, you know, a flag of another country and saying, you know, let me in, let me in. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, uh, I've said this before and I'll say it again, Uh, um, there needs to be doors in the wall. And I'm talking metaphorically here. But there needs to be doors, and those doors need to be clearly marked. Are you here to come to be a citizen? Are you here to come to work seasonally? Are you here to come to get an education? We need to know, and, and, and in any case, you need to sign the guest book on the way in, and we need to yes. know that you're here, and we need to know why you're here. If you're here to acquire citizenship, that's fine, too. There's a process for that. Yeah. If you're here to work, make money, and then go back to your family, and then come back again and work seasonally or whatever to make money for your family, that's fine, too, but we need to know you're here. Okay, that's not too much to ask, and that is, to me, a national security imperative. We're talking with Congressman Rick Crawford. I know we're about out of time, uh, and I know this may be a big question, but we have Adam uh, Adam Schiff, and, and he's trying to launch all these investigations. I know you're on the House Intel Committee, uh, and I think the American people are, are going to get tired. They're, I think they're going to get tired of ju- of not investigating Russia. I mean, that's what the mainstream media is saying. This is Russia, Russia. This is now just personal. This is now let's just investigate President Trump and his entire life. Well, it's absolutely personal, and it got personal between Adam Schiff and Chairman Devin Nunes uh, a couple of years ago. So uh, it got so personal that Devin Nunes withdrew from uh, the Russia investigation, turned it over to Mike Conaway, just to make sure there were no, uh, uh, you know, stumbling blocks to that investigation. And he did not recuse himself. Let's be clear about that. You can they, they like using that word. He didn't recuse himself. He withdrew from the investigation so as not to uh, give the, you know, the, the I guess, the uh, impression that maybe the, the investigation might be tainted. That's number one. Number two, he went over to the White House to apprise uh, the White House officials of, of something that took place. White House has a permanent record of, of these visits. They, they have to log in these visits, whereas Adam Schiff met with Glenn Simpson, founder of Fusion GPS, and has yet to report that to the committee. So Adam Schiff threw a fit about the chairman of the Intelligence Committee interacting with the White House, which is public record, and because, because we should have been notified by that, uh, about that visit. But he didn't bother to notify us about his visit with Glenn Simpson. Who, you know, I don't have time to get into all the Glenn Simpson yeah. uh, Fusion GPS drama, but you get the point. Yes. He has yet to notify the committee that he met with. Oh, he just insists that was a chance meeting. Um, give me a break. You know, I, I just happened to be in Aspen when Glenn Simpson was in Aspen. <laughs> Whatever. I, yeah. Maybe he ran into, uh, you know, uh, Lloyd Christmas and Harry Dunn while he was up there. <laughs> That's exactly know. what I was thinking. I can't hear the, the the word the city of Aspen without it, without thinking of Dumb and Dumber. Um, yeah. <laughs> Congressman Rick Crawford, uh, it's always great to have you on. I appreciate the fine work that you're doing, and uh, I hope you have a great weekend, sir. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All righty.